Dear ladies and gentlemen, good evening. As most of you know, the John Adams Institute is bringing you many cultural, educational, and even entertaining events with a focus on American culture. We have lectures on several topics, as wide as on the latest biography of Shakespeare, as on the newest history of New Amsterdam. We just finished a program for high school kids in our Quincy Club program that included 19 high school visits and a special website to tell you all about the US elections. And we always have our literary events. Some of these events bring authors with renowned names like John Irving, Donna Tart, and Paul Oster. Sometimes they are not so well known yet. We have, had, we have welcomed the likes of Andrew Sean Greer and James Fry to mention only two names of young, bright writers who mounted our stage recently. Tonight's guest is a nice mix of the unknown and the established author. After he wrote his debut, I met him and promised him if his second book would be as good as the first one, he could be one of our guests. Thanks to his Dutch publishing house, De Geus, um, they made a beautiful edition of his book in Dutch. We were able to have him in our program. And so I'm happy to announce to you Arthur Phillips as our guest of honor tonight. We are glad you came back to Amsterdam and brought your wife Janet along. In a moment, Arthur will start his talk, but before we will do, he will do so, let me outline tonight's program. Ruth Meyer, journalist for VPRO's ROM Television, a program on national TV for the arts, will introduce Arthur Phillips briefly. Then Arthur will read and talk about his books, after which he will be interviewed here on the stage by Ruth Meyer. I believe the audience will be allowed to ask questions later on, but you will be um, addressed later on. There will be no intermission, and we will close around 9.30. For now, please switch off cell phones, and may I ask Ruth to take the floor. Good evening. The more I read of the Egyptologist, the sorrier I felt for Arthur Phillips, the author of this remarkable second novel. In an age of confessional literature, in which authors recycle their own lives, loves, frustrations, and sufferings into novels, readers more and more have a tendency to identify the main character of a story with its author. The personage of Ralph Trillipush, the Egyptologist from the title, who obsessively searches the Egyptian desert for a pharaoh's grave, in the end really becomes a man to feel sorry for. He's broke, crippled, alone, hungry, thirsty, his fingers are bleeding, his mind is reeling, his grip on reality slowly eaten away by hallucinations. The French method writer Frédéric Bébédère climbed two years in a row the Tour Montparnasse to write Windows on the World, an inside novel about the attack on the World Trade Center. Sitting in Le Ciel de Paris, the Parisian equivalent of the WTC restaurant Windows on the World, he wanted to summon all the feelings that the people trapped in the Twin Towers had just before and during the terrorist attacks. In order to write this novel, Big Bader just had to feel, if only the tiniest bit, the fears, the claustrophobia, the horror, and the pain of those 3,000 poor people must have felt on 9-11. Reading The Egyptologist, I had visions of Arthur Phillips sitting on his knees in the desert for two years, digging in the sand with his bare hands until his fingers bled, uttering incomprehensible sounds vocalized by a throat that was dry and sore, thinking thoughts possessed by a brain that just had been fried by the merciless sun. The more I read about Ralph Trillipush suffering, the more my admiration for Arthur Phillips' dedication and determination grew. Ernest Hemingway once said, write about what you know. Arthur Phillips, in my mind, surely had done that. I pictured him filling notebooks with bleeding hands in the cruel desert. Yesterday evening, while enjoying a lovely dinner cooked by Monique Knappen, 
the director of the institute. Mr. Phillips, between two sips of white wine, shamelessly admitted that he had written the whole of the Egyptologist outside a Paris sidewalk cafe. So much for the romanticism of writing. You always killed my appetite there, Arthur. The two days you spent in Egypt don't really count, do they? And the fact that there are two glass pyramids in front of the Paris Louvre doesn't either, does it? I suddenly realized that, like most of the characters in The Egyptologist, Arthur Phillips isn't the man that he seems to be. Although he claims to be a writer now, his biography boasts a Harvard education and careers as a child actor, a jazz musician, a speechwriter, a dismally failed entrepreneur, and a five-time Jeopardy champion. I also remembered that the same man wrote a novel about Budapest called Prague. I don't know about you, Arthur. I think I want to have a word with you. But would you be so kind as to read something from the Egyptologist for us first, ladies and gentlemen, Arthur Phillips. I'll be the third person to drink from this water. Uh, I'm willing to go to any length for my art. Uh, I did spend two harrowing years at Le Fumoir, which is an excellent cafe, uh, right across the street from the Louvre, where they have a fantastic Egyptology collection, which I will someday visit. Um, uh, I, I am, uh, I'm a professional liar, in fact, and uh, am pleased finally to be making a living at it after years of otherwise embarrassing myself doing other things. Um, it's funny that Rude should mention write what you know, which of course is Hemingway's dictate that you must write what you know. Um, I find that very constricting as a law. And if, there's, if there are aspiring writers here tonight, I don't know. It, like any other writing rule, which you will be told in the course of your classwork or your colleagues uh, speaking to you about your work, you should ignore it freely. Um, on that note, I, I uh, am so delighted to be here in these surroundings and hosted by Monique. It is such an honor. Uh, and it's so incredibly heartwarming to come to Amsterdam and find an interest in American literature that would fill a beautiful room like this. Uh, I, am, I can't claim to be a European writer as much as I would like to, as much as I've spent years wishing that someday I could say I was a European writer. I grew up reading European literature and have not stopped now for about 30 years. Um, and the one thing I have not been able to make of myself is a European writer. It's no, I, I, I cast no aspersion on American literature, which I love and which I admire enormously, many of whose writers I think very highly of, but it is very much European writers that have influenced me from the time I fell in love with King Arthur stories when I was about five, for obvious reasons, uh, through the time I intended to become a musketeer uh, and or work as a consulting detective for Scotland Yard. Um, my first book, maybe not surprisingly, was Prague, and it was set in a place where I had lived uh, for two years as opposed to for the, it was four days, as a matter of fact. Right? I spent four formative days in Egypt prior to writing this book. 13 years prior to writing this book, actually. Um, uh, and as I was, I was thinking this evening, Prague, again, despite having spent several years now living in various parts of Europe, despite having traveled widely and having read widely of European letters, I'm not a European writer. And I never feel so American as when I stand uh, on a European sidewalk, as I was today, and walk up and down the streets, absorbing another wonderful place. I lived in Budapest for a couple of years, and I wrote a novel that was not autobiographical, but was very much steeped in my love for Budapest and my love for the time that I spent there, which was immediately following the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I have taken great pride, as I've been describing the Egyptologist, uh, in being able to say it's entirely different. It's an entirely different book. There's no relation whatsoever. Uh, Prague was set in the 90s. This is set in 1922. Prague was set in a place I knew very well and loved and had lived in. This is set in a place I have scarcely visited. Half the book is actually set in Australia, where I have not been at all. Um, uh, and uh, Prague was a, a relatively slow-moving drama of cultures clashing and, uh, and, and people finding themselves, a bildungsroman. This, is, this has elements of mystery and adventure story and thriller and historical romance, although it is not exactly any of those things. 
So I've gone around and promoted the book in the United States and said how proud I was that they were so different books, and people have believed me because I am a professional liar. Um, and then as I was thinking today, I realized the similarities, of course. They're about uh, people trying to find themselves in a foreign country, people who are describing their, their own personalities and setting their own personalities against a culture of which they are uh, forever locked out no matter how much study they, they put into it. And so it is with Ralph Trillipush. Ralph Trillipush is an Egyptologist, a scholar of the culture and history of ancient Egypt. He has made a slight reputation for himself. This is 1922. He's a British Egyptologist. Has made a slight reputation for himself in the United States as a leading scholar of King Atumhadu, the last king of the 13th dynasty in Egypt, and has uh, set off to find the tomb of King Atumhadu. If you're familiar with Egyptology at all, 1922 is an important year. It's the same year that Howard Carter uh, is on the track of King Tutankhamun, a very minor king, but with a potentially promising tomb he thinks he can find in the Valley of the Kings. Simultaneously, Trillipush is trying to find the tomb of King Atumhadu. He has translated Atumhadu's writings into English. Uh, he has made his name on those translations, published admittedly by a pornographic publisher in the United States because Atumhadu is that sort of king. Um, and he has set off to Cairo with his fiancé's father's money, bankrolling his expedition. He stops in Cairo for a few days to supply him his expedition prior to heading south to the site. And since he has some time to kill, he decides he might as well start writing the book about the expedition that he has now set off on, including the triumphant moment in which he discovers the tomb of King Atumhadu. Well, admittedly, that hasn't happened yet, but it's not a problem as far as Trillipush is concerned. Uh, and he begins to write the... Uh, dedication to the book. He designs the cover of this book, the photograph which will be taken of him standing next to the tomb of King Atumhadu eventually. Uh, he uh, figures he might as well dedicate the book, write an epigraph to the book, um, and he writes about the author. So we'll find out about Ralph Trillipush. He writes this in October of 1922, and by necessity to fill in the blanks, he assumes that King Atumhadu's tomb will be found in November of 1922. So one month prior to the discovery, he writes about the author. Professor Ralph M. Tr I'm sorry, he's English. Are there any English people here this evening? Okay, then I will not do my English accent. Um, my, my hope is that a Dutch audience wouldn't have known any better. But For the Dutch in the audience, this is a flawless English accent you're about to hear. You'll note the intonations of a northern Oxford education. Not to worry. Uh, Professor Ralph M. Trillipush was born 24 November 1892, the only child of the renowned soldier and explorer Egbert Trillipush, and was raised a well-adored, if not positively spoilt, only child in the green, idyllic comfort of Trillipush Hall in Kent, England. Educated at home by tutors, he displayed at a precocious age a staggering aptitude for language and an uncanny absorption in ancient Egypt. By the age of 10, he had mastered the three written forms of ancient Egyptian and had begun translating ancient documents into English. By 12, he had recalculated the accepted dates of the Egyptian dynasties and kingly reigns, pinpointing with greater accuracy than any acknowledged scholar the gaps in modern Egyptological understanding. Admired by his peers, remarked upon by his elders, he went early up to Balliol, Oxford, where he was widely viewed as Egyptology's greatest hope, along with his dear friend Hugo Sinjin Marlowe. At Oxford, the two students worked under the guidance of the late Professor Clement Wexler, participating in his efforts to prove or disprove definitively the existence of the then apocryphal 13th Dynasty king and erotic poet Atumhadu. His master's work complete, Trillipush's doctoral studies were cut short by the Great War, during which both he and Marlowe served as officers in Egypt in counterintelligence. There, under enemy fire, the two explorers managed to unearth a fragment of Atumhadu's written memoirs from a cliffside path near Deir el-Bahari. Shortly after this discovery, Trillipush was sent along to advise Australian forces invading Gallipoli, in which combat he was wounded and for some time missing and believed dead. Entirely alone, he trekked back to Egypt, arriving after the armistice, only to learn that his great friend, Marlowe, had been killed whilst on expedition in an unsecured part of the Egyptian desert. After demobilization, Trillipush secured the fragment of the Atum Hadu memoirs, bringing it to the United States of America, where he launched a brilliant academic career. He produced the definitive, if controversial, translation and analysis of the fragments, published under the title Desire and Deceit in Ancient Egypt, Collins' Amorous Literature, 1920. The extraordinary sales of this short masterwork confirmed Trillipush's unique position as both an impeccable scholar and a popular interpreter of Egyptian studies. His full 
professorship and subsequent quick ascension to chair of the Egyptology department at Harvard University, followed his discovery on his 30th birthday, 24 November 1922, of the tomb of Atum Hadu himself and the publication of the gripping but academically flawless work you now hold in your perspiring hands. The discovery of Atum Hadu's tomb was quickly hailed as unprecedented, the most financially and scientifically rewarding discovery in the history of Egyptian excavation. Professor Trillipush was knighted in 1923 and has been honored by governments and universities throughout the civilized world. He is married to the former Margaret Finneran of Boston, Massachusetts, USA, the fantastically wealthy department store heiress. And actually, to this extent, I think Root correctly identifies my autobiographical urges. Uh, only in that I was the little kid sitting around reading European fiction from a very early and obsessive age, never to get over it. And to that extent, I think there are lines of autobiography in this novel, although I don't end up, as Trillipush does, digging in the sand for the tomb of Atum Hadu. But the process of writing a book, writing a novel particularly, I think is uh, comparable to, um, to exploring a tomb, where you're not exactly sure where you're headed, but you know that something is beyond the next wall, or so you'd hope. And even though you might spend months digging at nonsense, you might hope to end up with some treasure not far beyond. Um, I didn't know anything about Egyptology when I started the book, and I don't particularly claim to know anything now. But to the extent that I know anything, I owe it to a Dutchman, as a matter of fact. I began writing and leaving blank spaces, as Trillipush did, to fill in the important parts later. Um, and whenever I came upon a realization I don't have an answer, I don't know anything about Egyptology, I would simply leave a blank and say, insert research here. Um, and I would keep writing until I ran out of ideas. Finally realizing I have to do something, I went to the internet uh, and found out that the British Museum would answer my questions as part of their mandate. The British Museum is required to answer the questions of the public, I found out. And there I found a Dutch Egyptologist, uh, a young I didn't know at the time when he was. I imagined a, actually an Egyptologist with a pith helmet and um, full mutton chops. Um, I found out later, he, and when I met him, he was about 12. Um, uh, I, he's not here tonight. Marcel is not by any chance. OK. Um, no one here knows Marcel, do they? No, OK. Uh, he's, it turns out that there's uh, a wonderful Dutch Egyptologist sitting in London answering the questions of mildly pornographic authors in Paris um, willing to draw the hieroglyphs which form the frontispiece of this book, willing to translate into hieroglyphs the stationery which forms another illustration of the book. Um, I probably send an email to Marcel, the Egyptologist, every two or three days for six months um, and learned all I needed to learn for free about Egyptology. One of the things I found out was what the meaning of this name Atum Hadu is. King Atum Hadu uh, of the 13th dynasty, means Atum is aroused, Atum being a god in the uh, Egyptian pantheon. Are there, any, are there any Egyptologists at all here tonight? <laughs> well, I should speak a little more frankly about my expertise then. Uh, <clears throat> Atum, of course. Uh, uh, Atum was the first of the Egyptian gods in the Egyptian pantheon. Uh, and he found himself standing alone on a, a mound of fertile soil in the universe. And alone and lonely, uh, he did what any of us probably would have done. Any guesses, anybody? Guess what Atum did? I feel this is suitable for my audience. All right, we'll have Trillipush will explain then. The name Atum Hadu translates as Atum is aroused. And as any schoolboy who has studied the Egyptian pantheon is quick to note, memorize, and then quote in his own defense when interrupted in solitary creativity by a nosy parent, Atum, the creator, the first being, and thus quite, quite alone, made all the other gods and the world too by using his own celestial hand to spill his own celestial seed onto fertile ground. Atum is aroused. We are on the verge of creation. Our king was named for that throbbing instant immediately prior to the creation of the universe. In one reproduced ancient drawing I found as a boy, and spent several hours amazedly pondering until, from over my shoulder, the village librarian spotted it with a stifled shriek and confiscated the book. Solitary, tirelessly creative, and divinely flexible Atum performs a service on himself that most mortal men's spines will not allow them to execute, although they all know it would be a marvelously convenient knack. 
Although, in my day, I once saw twin Chinese brothers, acrobats in a traveling circus passing through Kent, who matched the god's feet while hanging quite nude and pale yellow from trapezes, an act of post-performance relaxation they indulged in upside down and side by side, like two eighth notes, late at night in the darkened tent after every show, whilst outside one could hear the drugged elephant being washed. That pretty much actually synopsizes the book quite well, I think, <laughs> if anyone is looking for a synopsis of this book. Speaking of the circus, um, the other about two-thirds of the book is told by Ralph Trillipush. It is his letters back to his fiance and his financiers in Boston. It is his journals of the excavation for the tomb of King Atumhadu, the inevitably successful excavation. He's certain every step of the way. Um, his, uh, his memoirs both and his description of the, of the life of Atumhadu such as we understand it. About a third of the book is told by an Australian private detective 30 years later. It's 1954, and he has been contacted by the heirs of Trillipush's fiancée to try to understand what happened in 1922. And he reminisces about his greatest case. Uh, and I'll just take one moment from his, his recollections. As he visits a circus, a circus in Sydney, Australia, in 1922. Um, any Australians? Any Would you know if my Australian accent was awesome? <laughs> I'm afraid you probably would. <clears throat> I, paid for a fr I paid for a front row seat. No, I won't do that to you. I paid for a front row seat, says the detective, and the bald man emerged to tear the ticket he had just sold me and then showed me to my place, pulling the canvas shut behind us. I counted the audience. I was one of eight, although there were empty benches and risers and a row of large divans with tables and seats, all told, set for 300 or some. My usher sat me, then continued down the empty aisle, stepped over the flaking red wooden wall in front of me, opened a gate in the high metal fence circling the sandy pit, locked the gate behind him, and picked up a megaphone. His red velvet trousers were white at the seat. Ladies and gentlemen, he yelled, walking in circles, looking high over my head at long-ago crowds. His opening remarks finished, he unwound his whip and lifted a hatch at the back of the cage. Three monstrous tigers slunk in. And our bald man lazily attended to making them leap over each other, roll on their backs, spring through a metal ring, all of which they performed sluggishly, but with sudden bursts of snarling rebellion, which the whip didn't shut up too quickly. And for his finale, he had the tigers lie down, not without resistance, and he opened again the hatch at the back of the cage. There, dramatically lit from behind, was a strange little profile, and then in waddled a penguin. The bird circled the prone tigers once, he promenaded up and down their backs, and then he log-rolled of them. He walked in place on their bellies as the tigers rolled underneath him. And finally, the penguin stepped off, took a turn of the ring for applause, and then approached the three tigers to kiss each of them in turn on the nose, previously sprayed with herring scent. The children gasped and laughed. It was a neat display, I'd imagine, when it worked. <laughs> Today, though... The third cat had had enough. As the fish-stinking kiss brushed his twitching, whiskered muzzle, there was a blur of orange and black paw, and the penguin looked down at the three red stripes on his white breast with the surprise of a rich man who spilled claret on his evening shirt. He raised his beaked head, astonished. He looked to the lazy tiger keeper who trained him, talked him into this twice-daily escapade, <laughs> and was himself stunned at the tiger's break in discipline. He was now raising his whip and shouting at the cat, but too late. The paw flashed again, and the suddenly headless penguin rocked in place but didn't tip over because the cat's other paw was pinning the flipper feet to the sand. The tiger was about to enjoy the snack he had just uncorked when he felt the lash bite his back, and he turned with a roar on the man who'd both whipped and fed him since his tiger cub days. You don't snarl at me, boy -o, shouted my ticket vendor, flogging with a fury. Only now did the two children in the audience realized that the penguin, whose antics they had just been admiring, was not well. <clears throat> As its head, beady-eyed and baffled, had come to rest on the red wooden wall a few rows in front of them. For reasons Mrs. Hoyt, the proprietor of the circus, explained to me as a matter of discipline for the beasts and safety to their master, the cats were required to perform their entire routine again, without fail, before they could be allowed out of the cage for their meat reward. While the two children sobbed and their parents told them, no, 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 it's all just a trick, the tigers, growling and irritable, reviewed their tasks and swatted at their man. 
Again, the leaping, the rolling, the springing through rings. Again, they all lay down facing forward. Again, the back hatch lifted. Again, a dramatic silhouette of a plump, banana-nosed fellow. And again, a trained penguin walked in, expecting to win applause and a fresh fish. What this second penguin thought as it passed the decapitated, (laughs) dusty football of its colleague, I cannot say. No, no, fly away, cried the little boy to my left. Fly away! I only mentioned this scene to illustrate the state of the circus by 1922, for I then watched two middle-aged Chinese contortionists twist themselves into the most peculiar shapes to audience discomfort. I watched a single spangled trapeze man swing listlessly for a spell before just dropping onto his net and from there to the ground, taking off his costume even as he was walking away. And all through it, a visibly disheartened man of 60 played an out-of-tune, upright piano. From time to time, he murmured with a pained seriousness at the frightened children, Ah, the circus, it's magical, just magical. The, the, uh, among the many themes that I realize runs throughout both Prague and the Egyptologist is the person trying to find themselves in a foreign culture, the person desperately trying to make a mark for themselves, usually as a, in regards to a foreign culture, um, and, and much more in this book, of course, the quest for immortality, which is a defining feature of Egyptian culture, my wife and I were at the Rijksmuseum today, and as we were looking at the proud Dutch burghers uh, posing and the memento mori paintings of the violins and the melting candles and the uh, sparkling fish and the lemon pips, um, the, uh, the certainty of leaving behind a material record of themselves struck me as very Egyptian uh, at the Rijksmuseum today. I felt very much as if I were walking through tombs laden with pictures of beautiful food, which was due to come back to life. Uh, And on that note, I'll read one more passage, and then Rude will come and join me for some discussion. Things did not go particularly well at this part of the excavation for Trillipush, and he begins to uh, speculate on the difference between the Egyptian desire for immortality and the reality at the end of Atum Hadu's reign when things had gone terribly, terribly wrong, when there was, uh, when there were invasions from the south and the north, when there were rebel kings rising up, when Egypt itself seemed to be collapsing for all time into the sand. The end of everything. This is the adult's bogeyman, the only ghoul that survives the nursery to rise before us from time to time and give us quakey guts. This is more than the fear of death, For at one's own demise, one clutches to the condolence that at least something else lives on that represents us or matters to us, somehow preserves us, if only it's the knowledge of the things and the people that we love surviving us and enduring. Our children's lives continue, so ours do not really end. This is modern man's pathetic scrap of Egyptian immortality. Some, of course, will cling to their subdued Christian heaven or sternly orgiastic Allah's paradise. But for most, there's something simpler in the wings. Kids, grandkids, the family business, the life's work, or just the trappings of one's humdrum affairs, the pub, the high street, the football club. If one is not depressed by these institutions plowing on heartlessly, unmoved by one's death, then one is conversely heartened, and they become like the drawings of food on a pharaonic tomb wall. Yes, the average man grabs at immortality with his dying breath, and he finds it in his heirs, his work, his town, his culture. But the end of everything... How much destruction must man or nature wreak before your death becomes intolerably petty and truly mortal? Do you need an ice age or a swollen sun incinerating the earth? Would less suffice to end your fantasies of permanence, your heirs slaughtered before your closing eyes, your business in bankruptcy, your home, your art in cinders? Let us say your church and all of its priests and every written or graphic mention of your God is destroyed danced on by the sharp-clawed demons who serve some other younger and crueler god. Let us say the city that has withstood all invaders for thousands of years, the city your family has lived in for as far back in time as you can peer, this pearl of the sea or the sands, this green and pleasant England, this eternal Rome, this pink Jerusalem, holy Mecca, this home of you and yours is dismantled. Every last brick, the last bomb flattening the last house, just before the last spittily drops of blood pump clear of your stuttering heart. Venice sinks into the sea. Paris burns. London howls. New York crumbles. Athens is reduced to its net ash. Not yet the end of everything for you. Every copy of every work of every author of the world's literature ignites under the watchful eyes of unquenchably pyromaniacal illiterates. 
the very last copy of the very last history of your country or any other changes into black smoke. And all you can hope in your last breath is for the scantiest sliver of immortality. Perhaps, some generations from now, word of mouth from one long-memoried genius actor to his heir, to his heir, to his heir, will result in a brave effort to recall Hamlet and write it down again. And what does happen at the end? Hamlet poisons himself? Thumps Polonius with a club in a darkened room? Dresses up as a grave digger? Sneaks out the back? The following items will be irretrievably lost someday quite soon. Beethoven's works, the beer you prefer, all record of your ancestry, the place you first kissed a girl, toffee, coffee, the landscape you associate with peace and liberty, any evidence of your boyhood, real or imagined, the sensation that all that stands before you and your loved ones is a series of aspirations and accomplishments and setbacks, meals, ceremonies, loves, heartbreaks, recoveries, next acts, Will you remember me, Margaret? Will you see what I accomplished here? Will you clarify it for the world? I have no one else, you see, to trust anymore. If you ever loved me, or only the idea of me, please, please rid yourself of your illnesses and make my work live on. I have much to finish, especially if Farrell is coming to stamp about with the police and the dogs. So Rude and I, I think, will have a talk about this and other things, and I very much encourage you to ask questions, which I am happy to take on any topic that amuses you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. You want your own water this time? Yeah, I think I have three <laughs> to make up for it. Thank you. Are you on? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I just said mockingly that um, you don't seem to be the person that you seem to be. Um, this might be a, a moment to get acquainted with the audience. Um, you were born in Minneapolis. Could you tell us something about your childhood there, your family life? Um, I had a uh, I'm afraid uh, people don't like to hear these things. I had a uh, perfectly happy and lovely childhood. Um, I was raised by kind and intelligent people who were... I'm so sad. It's, I'm, I have no future. Um, I was raised by a nice lawyer and a social worker and in a house in which uh, education and literature and art and um, this evening discussion was part of uh, our life. I was the third of three children. We had a small dog. Um, <laughs> we lived on a lake. Uh, I studied bullfighting. Um, uh, <laughs> no, of course I can't. I didn't study bullfighting. Um, uh, everything was true up until that point. Um, uh, so my childhood was lovely. I was encouraged to do anything that caught my attention. So you expected to do well in school, but beyond that, I uh, got the chance to play music. I was an actor in a local theater and on, in television commercials. Um, uh, uh, I fenced, um, which was not all that common, but it was a direct result of having read The Three Musketeers. Um, and I read obsessively. Yeah. So. Uh, child, child actor, it says. You just said... Um school theater and uh, commercials. How did you get there? Were you talented? This, this, might, be, <laughs> this might be a qualification. I, I was enormously talented. Um, no, I don't think particularly. I was, um, uh, I wanted to try it and that was enough. It was, a, it was quite a good theater, um, a, quite a renowned theater until it collapsed in scandal a few years later, which is actually true. Um, not because of me that anyone can prove. Um, uh, so no, I was not much of an actor. I wasn't particularly good at any of these things. I was quite a poor musician and a very bad business person, and uh, I failed at a large number of things, actually. But I was always willing to try, so. Yeah. You didn't fail at Harvard, I understand. What did you study there? I studied medieval, Euro can people hear if I don't move the microphone back and forth? I studied medieval European history, um, because I, you know, I wanted to make a lot of money. And it seemed <laughs> an obvious, an obvious choice. Uh, 
So I think it should have been law then. Yes, see, then I made another mistake. So, uh, I, again, it, my entire university career was decided when I was six uh, because I read King Arthur stories. And then from King Arthur stories, I read stories of the kings of England. And then I thought, well, that's what I want to study. And then I got to Harvard and majored in medieval European history and studied climate change and potato famine for 500 years, um, or what seemed at the time like 500 years. Uh, so I, it, I didn't fail Harvard, but not for lack of trying. So, What kind of career did you have in mind when you decided to? Uh, I went through a lot. I didn't, I didn't begin writing until I was probably 27 or 28, so my, careers, my career plans adjusted very quickly. Teaching, uh, maybe? No, I... Uh, do I admit this to a Dutch <laughs> No, I intended to go to the Central Intelligence Agency. It seemed like a good Should idea. Should you laugh now? No, I'm afraid. I mean, you certainly are welcome to laugh. Uh, it, again, it seemed like a very good idea at the time. So I didn't, it didn't proceed very far. No. Unless I've got the most brilliant cover ever devised. <laughs> Um, and then I, uh, after that, I, I wanted to go to Europe, and so I got a job which took me to Budapest in 1990. And then I was, after that, I, I went through a series of jobs, none of which had much logic until I took up jazz music. So. Could we go back to Budapest? Why sure. Budapest? Uh, I finished university in 1990, and the revolutions had just come to Eastern Europe. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to see history unfold, uh, and Eastern Europe was plainly the only place to go. I had no family connection to Hungary, no language, no Hungarian, um, but that's where I wanted to go. So I got a, any job that I could have gotten, I would have taken, and I got a job working as an assistant to an American businessman. Did the fall of the, of the war or the, the destruction of communism have anything to do with that? Hmm. Everything to do with it. That was, that was world history unfolding. Václav Havel was someone you would read about in a history book. Um, uh, I, I missed, you know, I missed D-Day, unfortunately, and I missed the occupation of Germany. Um, but I could do this, and that, that even though I wasn't going to do anything, I was going to go and see it, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to see it. That's all. Do you think these events for Americans are different uh, than for Europeans because of the Cold War and everything, and uh, communism sort of like was the the boogeyman for Americans for, for, for a long, long time. I don't know. I, I, I wasn't how, in Western how, Europe. How were you brought up by your father, for instance, uh, uh, towards communism? Did he ever talk about it? Well, he talked about politics. It was we were, we were not unreasonable. He didn't have an unreasonable view of the world, I wouldn't say. But I'm sure America in general had a, had a triumphalist feeling in 1989, 90 that probably didn't extend to Western Europe. I don't know. Um, you know, we did it. You didn't do it. No, no, no. <laughs> I brought the Berlin Wall down. Yeah. Um, uh, so there was, you know, I think general uninformed American opinion was probably much more triumphalist than general uninformed Dutch opinion. Um, and there was, a, I'm sure there was a sense of relief everywhere, universally. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah? it does. Yeah. Um, I just said the novel about Budapest was called Prague. Is Prague a sort of a metaphor for, for something? Well, the, the book is about people looking, people believing incorrectly usually that, that somewhere else or some other time nostalgically or some other career or job or some other person or will somehow f make them feel more fulfilled, of course. And that plays itself out in a lot of ways. One of the ways is among the American expatriates who lived in Budapest, in early 1990s, there was a strange suspicion in some people's minds that they had missed the important place, that somehow Prague was the important place, that Prague was where the great artists were gonna come from, that Prague was where the better parties were happening, that Prague was in some way more important, maybe because Havel was more photogenic, maybe because Prague is more photogenic than Budapest. Um, I assume that the people in Prague were understandably thinking that they should go to Budapest. Um, so some people had this sense of envy, this inexplicable sense that they had, even, so, even no matter how far they had come, they had missed it. So the book is called Prague for that reason. Yeah. The place you missed, that you should have been, which of course is no better than the place you really are. Yeah. Looking back, do you think you've missed it? 
should you have gone there? No, I never thought, I never felt that. Uh, but it's, it, for, but in, in the United States, I don't know if the same thing has happened in Western Europe, but in the United States, Prague did become um, a short symbolic term for post-Cold War Eastern Europe, and particularly Westerners living in post-Cold War Eastern Europe. It's generally called Prague for some reason, um, for no good reason. Uh, so it has, it has taken on that sort of, it's become a place, it's become one of those, I don't, again, I don't know if this is true in, in the Netherlands, but it's become one of those places where time and place have come together to make some, some legendary moment. Paris in the 1920s, for Americans at least, is a legendary moment, and maybe San Francisco in the 1960s, or uh, Prague in the 1990s. And I was there enough to know there's no reason for it. So it's nonsense. It was just a feeling. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, coming back to the novels for Prague, um, I think your wife told me yesterday you had the first chapter for the Egyptologist, you had the ending. Um, how were these experiences of writing? Because writing backwards must have been a hell of a job. I mean, character development backwards story backwards? Um, yeah. I've written two books. I'm, I'm working on a third, and every time seems to be different. You started in the middle this time. I did, actually. <laughs> I, did. I did. Yeah, that's what came first. So you, yeah. you, you take what you get. <coughs> you take what comes, and you write in whatever direction you have an idea. You know, a novel is a wonderfully um, fraudulent form. Uh, you, you read a novel, and I always have, and I still do, even though I now know better. And you have the impression that a writer had a story in his head, in her head, which he or she then went and wrote down for you, which you are now reading just as it occurred in their head. But of course, it's not true. And it never happened. It certainly never happened to me, and it may never have happened to any writer. It's a process that you start in the middle or the end, and you come back, and you, the first part doesn't work, so you change it, and then you rewrite the whole thing 10 times. Um, so writing backwards, I had heard uh, John Irving had always, John Irving had said, I read this in an interview, that he always starts at the end. He always has a moment at the end and works backwards. And I didn't know what he meant. It seemed impossible. Um, but of course, writing a novel always seemed impossible to me too. How could you possibly write so many words about anything? Um, so writing backwards, writing forwards, it's been wonderfully different each time, but it's, it's all the same in a way. Yeah. Coming back to the characters, normally you create a character and through the pages, the chapters, the years, just like real human beings, they develop. Wasn't that a problem? No, that's, a, that's a fraudulent notion as well. Um, at least in my case. I don't know if other people have fully formed characters. They know all about their history, their life, their, what will happen to them, and then they begin and then set them into a book. Uh, I don't think it happens like that for most people. Um, a character is something that is pieced together over the two years or four years it takes to write a book. And the character begins with, uh, it could begin, one character might begin with uh, a gesture. Uh, Kundera has talked about and talks inside the book about starting a character from a gesture of a woman throwing a ball. Who is this woman that throws a ball like that? I, who would, what sort of person would find himself in the last two pages? And work backwards, and and you add you you add clay over the course of two years, so you're still writing a character two years later. Yeah, I, I, at least I do. Yeah. Um, the the Prague story started with a sort of a short story. Was there already a, a, a novel in your mind then? Or? No, I wanted to write about Budapest, which I loved, yeah. and I wanted to write about that place, which in time. Uh, I wanted to write about the sense that I have had in my life that everyone around me is not taking me seriously. I wanted to write about the feeling of everyone else knowing something I don't know. Um, and I wanted to write about Budapest. And I wanted to write about nostalgia, which cripples me. So, Why I does it cripple you? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I think it's a hereditary disease, uh, <laughs> I think. My father suffers quite badly. So. No, but if you say it cripples you, that's bad. Well, yeah, I, I, 
I, I'm a liar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I suffer from it more at some times than others. But um, yeah, there are times that it feels particularly overwhelming. And often for times, as with the case of the idea of Prague, for times that I know, in fact, were not worth feeling nostalgic about. But that's nostalgic for you, so. You're having difficulty living in the now. At times, yeah, yeah. sure. O always more or less yearning for. Not always, but when it, when, yeah, when during an outbreak, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, is writing a novel for you a sort of um, back to the future kind of time travel thing that satisfies you to cure your Well, it did in the case disease. of Prague. I don't think about Budapest nearly as much as I did when I was writing the book. Yeah. Um, and yet I'm terribly nostalgic for the time in which I wrote The Egyptologist. So, of course, it's impossible. You'll never catch up. You know? no. right. um, writing The Egyptologist, um, well, it, it is a question that you more or less answered. I mean, after I found out that you had been to Egypt only for four days, just to be corrected. <laughs> um, I imagined you sitting, sitting in the British Museum uh, for days on end. Yeah, no, somebody did. Somebody <laughs> did. Yeah. Our, our dear Marcel. Our dear Marcel, exactly. Yeah. Um, one of the first questions that you emailed was from, uh, how do I translate into hieroglyphs um, I'm aroused or something? Or uh, well, Atum is aroused. Atum so is aroused. How do you First email. Exactly. <laughs> you would call security. Then, <laughs> yeah. um, he's, the, he's my favorite Dutchman in the whole world right now. <laughs> uh, although his career, I would imagine, is now in terrible trouble. Um, well, what was his reaction? Wasn't he he, uh, he he was unflappable. Um, I really, I did imagine a, um, an, uh, an old and unflappable Egyptologist, and he, you know, he doesn't look like it. <coughs> he's made wonderful discoveries of his own as well. Yeah. You met him. I did finally meet him. Uh, he's made wonderful discoveries about the 13th dynasty specifically, uh, wall panels that hadn't been properly translated, explanations of some of this very murky part of Egyptian history. He was unflappable. He answered every one of my questions, increasingly bizarre questions, with more information than I could have hoped for. Yeah. Um, you needed this information for, um, I think you called it a cartouche? The picture at the beginning, yeah. yes. The cartouche is the what name. What was the function of a, a cartouche? A cartouche is, is, the, is the king's name. One of, actually, he has five names, but it's one of the king's names, written in hieroglyphs, ceremonially framed, I think, in an oval of rope, uh, and is used as his royal seal, his royal identification. And Atum Hadu, who I had invented, needed one as well. Uh, and it is it is the frontispiece, and it's it's wonderful the hieroglyphs necessary. I, I, I wish I had thought of them. But. Yeah. <coughs> um, some novel novels or some novelists um, try to say something about uh, the, the human condition, la condition humaine, like the French say. Um, they want to hold up a mirror to society. Um, if we, if we were to, to uh, look for that in this book, um, would we find it? Is that one of your goals also? It's never occurred to me as a goal. I, you, I mean, you can find it in anything. Um, that's the beauty of novels. Whether the author intended it or whether it was the author's goal, you will find things in novels that you want and need. Uh, maybe that's all I should say about that. Yeah. My goals are very limited. Extremely limited. I want. I would like to write books that I would read, and that would sit comfortably next to the books I admire. Um, and that's it. So you don't have the urge to to teach us something. No. No morality. Uh, no. I I take pride in being smart enough to know that I have nothing to teach, no morality to expound, and no human condition to illuminate for anybody. Do writers who do try to do this to us? Irritate you? Uh. <laughs> Not necessarily. It helps if they're dead. <laughs> uh, I, they have better credibility if they're dead, I think. 
So. Do they irritate you more then or less? <clears throat> if they're alive or dead? No, I'm, I'm, the dead almost never irritate me. No. Occasionally. Um, no, I, no, no, I, I, I'm, I, what I actually sincerely, truly believe is that there is an enormous diversity in the potential of the novel and that any dogma which I read everywhere and in every country which dictates that the novel must, the novel will, the novel should, the novel can better than anything else and ought to therefore is, I find very irritating. Um, similarly, the novel must never, the novel cannot, the novel need never, uh, I find unbearable. Beyond that, I'm, I'm in love with the novel, so. A couple of days ago, I talked to a writer who told me that some of her interviewers had made a remark, oh, so your novel is just a story. And she was very irritated by that. <laughs> if someone were to say this to you, what would your reaction be? I'm, I'm guess, I, I, don't, I don't understand it. I don't know what it means. Um, there are, there are books that I don't particularly care for because they don't seem to have anything else going on other than a description of things occurring. But there are stories, there are books. Kafka are often very simple stories about very simple characters doing very simple things, and yet one has the impression of a great depth underneath that still surface. Either that's because Kafka intended it and somehow built an invisible surface, or because he built something so perfectly still on the surface that any reader who brings depth and imagination will find things underneath it. So I think anyone who says about a book, it's only a story, betrays a certain lack of readerly imagination, probably more than any particular critique of what's been written, I would guess. Yeah. So. Your story, you, um, you chose to to locate it uh, during the 13th dynasty. Mm -hmm. Why that particular period? Just for, for purposes of fraudulence, that's, that there's a, there are holes in Egyptian history that uh, Egypt was in fact collapsing. Egypt did subsequently collapse from 90 to 100 years after that before a restoration. And I needed a place where I could hide an entire uh, reign of a king. Uh, which it, it was the best place to It hide. was the best place to hide and lie, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Most motivations will come back to that. So. Yeah. And did, did you make up this king? Or? By the way, I was a waiter once. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, so, sir. Not a particularly yeah. good waiter, though, obviously. Uh, did I make up? I'm sorry? I guess I have to pick up the bill. Then. Yes, exactly. Um, the king, Atum Hadou, mm -hmm. did you make him up? There is no evidence as of yet for his existence. <laughs> yes. But we are hopeful. You should go into politics. <laughs> yeah, well. yeah. Um, the site where you um, located his um, mm -hmm. tomb, mm -hmm. um, Deir al Habari? Deir al Habari, I think. That's not a coincidence. Uh, that that's where he was looking? Well, no, I mean, it's, these are just technical things. I know where Carter was. Carter was on the other side of the valley. Um, I know that there's a, a, a blank space there. I know that he's, he needs to circle around Winlock. Um, so you wanted him have, to have him next to I wanted to him Carter. to be right next door to Carter's yeah. excavation of Tutankhamen, yeah. 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 Um, did you ever see the treasures of Tutankhamen? Yes, yeah. that, actually, I, that is the extent of my Egyptology background. I was eight, I think, when they came through the United States on tour. Yeah. I was fascinated with the curse, of course. Yeah. Much more than the treasures, the curse was the best part. So. The curse of the mummy, yeah. like in the movie. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I also had a quote about uh, comparing archaeology with uh, writing, but you stole it away from me. Who did you get it from? I don't know. I, I found stole it on the it. internet. Stole it from me, probably. Maybe you should read it again because it's better on, on, on page. Oh, it's than, me. Than All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is it you? It seems to be me. Okay. <clears throat> the imagination is a mad and unrestrainable archaeologist, and for me, the writing of novels is starting to resemble nothing so much as a tomb excavation, begun with high hopes and limited information. 
A chamber is cleared. I'm thrilled with it. It's precisely the chamber that I set off expecting. But wait, what's down this hall? Another chamber, altogether grander, requiring just a luminous fact or two for clarity. And what I originally set off to find turns out to be nothing but a paltry antechamber, a lobby for a labyrinth I had never dreamt of, an underground palace I would never have found if I insisted on exploring only the well-lit regions of what I know. So, Is writing such a um, surprise? Some days, yeah. It's a, that's why it's such a pleasure. If you knew everything when you got started, the more you would know, I would think the harder it would be to write. Yeah. The fun of it is it's, it's almost reading. So, <laughs> Do you of, often come across rooms that you yeah. don't want to, oh. to enter because it takes you too far away from the story? Um, no, I like, I like tangents very much. And Prague was, I had a rule when I started writing Prague, all tangents will be permitted. And if they have to be uh, extracted later, then so be it. So. Yeah. Um, <coughs> authors, for instance, uh, the great Philip Roth, seem to be, this may sound a bit disrespectful, but seems to be writing the same book all over again. You know? um, he's always his own main character. It's always set in, 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 in Newark or something. You seem to be, those, these two books are so different. Are you a writer who uh, doesn't want to repeat himself? I don't know that that's my choice or, or something I get to have an opinion about. Um, I want to write a book that I would want to read, and so I want to be in, in, in excited to spend two years, three years, four years working on it. So if I have an idea that seems strong enough to merit that. Um, in, in America, particularly in the publishing business, the second novel is a time of enormous uh, worry. Is it, if it's too much like the first one, then you have no future. If it's too different, then you are indescribable and unsellable. Um, if, it's, if it's not as, you know, there's too many things that can go wrong. So I, I feel like I cleared that hurdle, and what happens next, I don't, yeah. I don't know yet. So, a mystery. Your publisher didn't tell you that this one was too different from the first one? No. No. If they did, they kept it to themselves. <laughs> yes. But it is. It's different. So you took a chance. Uh, it makes it sound very brave. <laughs> it's not uh, such a brave business. It's not bullfighting. No. So. Should we open it up to people to okay. be happy to take? You can be the moderator. How okay. About Any questions for Arthur Phillips? No, the only, the only authentic elements are that Howard Carter was, in fact, discovering King Tut's tomb at the time. He is located, according to the chronology described in his journals. Um, some of the Egyptology is correct. Some of the uh, discoveries made simultaneously and described are correct. But there's no, as far as I know, I had never read anything that said that. So if there's something that says, I'd lo I would love to know where that came from. But no, it's not. Not true. Yeah, I would love to. It would be great. I would love to see uh, the ground that I described because I have not. When I was in Egypt, I never went south to the valley of the Thebes area, and I relied on maps and websites and and grumpy Egyptologists. So I would very much like to see if I got it right. But I, you know, I can't even claim that I have some longing to embrace Egypt. I just. I spent my Egypt love on this book, I think. A nice place, certainly. People should visit. <laughs> yes, exactly.
On the other hand, people will bring me hot drinks if I go to this cafe every day. So, um, and yeah, I, I didn't have any particular philosophical opposition to going to Egypt. And I'd be happy to go now if somebody would pay my way to Egypt. Um, but I, I enjoyed reading the books and enjoyed imagining it instead. No, there's no evidence for the curse. Carnarvon, Carnarvon had a bad mosquito hunt. That was about it. Well, I believe I read somewhere that uh, in Prague there's no autobiographical stuff there. So there's two characters, John and Charles. And I'm curious as to which one is the stuff that's in the Um I actually gave myself a cameo appearance as the saxophone player in Prague. <laughs> so I'm most closely identified with the bad saxophone player. Um, uh, I, I find myself pretty evenly divided between those two characters. I, both of them at times do things that I did. Both of them say things that I have said or would, could agree with. Um, one of them is more my sensitive side. One is more my humorous side. You know, I, I, I like to separate myself. No. Well, but I'm just as much Emily and. Um, that's, that's all the writers do. Yeah, yeah. You, you, and you take pieces of everyone that you know and everyone you've ever met and anybody you can imagine, and everyone gets. I think it would be very difficult, actually, to produce a novel in which a character represents you completely. Because, of course, things happen to them that never happen to you, so you have to imagine, and before long you write in fiction, which is the point. I'm, I'm writing a novel. Um, it seems to be a Victorian ghost story. Um, but it might change. But that's the middle part that I got, was the Victorian ghost story. The second question, the seed of it, when I was walking my dog and I had an image in my head which ends up being the last two pages of the book. And I don't know where it came from. I don't know what, why anyone would think of such a thing. Um, but I, it stuck with me long enough to know that it was a book. Um, uh, yes, I was an obsessive reader, never about Egypt. I was an obsessive reader about knights and the kings of England and King Arthur, the musketeers. Um, uh, and then, for some reason, when I was 12 or 13, spies, um, and under, you know, obsessed with the history of the CIA and the British Secret Service, and uh, Mata Hari, who mentioned a national favorite, um, <laughs> and, um, and tended to read obsessively about whatever got my imagination. I was most part of it because I created the whole thing from my imagination without any um, particular knowledge. And then afterwards, I took it to people who knew Hungarian history, Hungarian publishing, and Hungarian uh, privatization law. And it was plausible to them. And then a year or two later, I was reading in Cleveland, and somebody said, that's my grandfather's story, um, which was a wonderful moment. Um, but I, he can't sue me. Right. I, I have a, it's all an affidavit. There's no chance. <laughs> Criminal liability. Yes. Uh, both longhand first, laptop later. Did you go to creative writing schools? I did not go to creative writing schools. Um, <laughs> um, are they? Are they? Are they? Do they exist in the Netherlands? Yeah. yeah. They're they're growing quite fast in Britain, and they're extremely fast, and of course, in the United States. Uh, I have strong opinions about them, but they're entirely from ignorance because I didn't go to one. Um, 
<laughs> well, okay. I'm an expert on something I know nothing about. Um, I'm, I have friends who have done it, and I know people who teach at them, and, I'm, uh, and I think there are good reasons to go to them. So having said that, I think they're probably incredibly dangerous uh, by the very structure of them. They can't be anything but dangerous for most people. Um, you are submitting yourself to a committee uh, on both your writing and you are helping other people submit their writing to a committee. And since, as I said, my only one true dogmatic belief is in the potential diversity of fiction, anything that is judged by committee will by necessity homogenize it. There's no way around it, except for the very strongest. And of course, they don't need to create a writing program in the first place. Um, so people have all kinds of good reasons for doing it. I need two years break from the real world. I have a, they gave me a grant. I can sit and write and read for two years. Uh, I just need some help. I just need someone to give me some advice. I mean, these are all good reasons. I have to show my parents that I'm not a fool. Um, but it, it seems to me uh, it can't do any good, really, I wouldn't think. And, and, I hear, and I hear it from publishers. I don't know if it's true here. I certainly hear publishers saying everything, a lot of first novels smell like MFA programs. Um, I've heard it in many countries. So it, there must be something to it. And a good friend of mine who's a poet and a very excellent poet and has said, he teaches in an MFA program, and he says, no, 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 no. All we are doing is helping talented people not reinvent the wheel. That was his exact phrase. Save you some time so you're not doing the same, not making a lot of mistakes to get to somewhere you have to get anyhow. Which to me is a, a criminal statement because, of course, you want to reinvent the wheel. Everyone should reinvent the wheel. This isn't science, and it isn't, in fact, automotive engineering. Everyone's invention of the wheel will be slightly different, and that's the point. Um, so that's my strong and entirely ignorant. I admit that it's probably wrong, but it's my prejudice. So I'm happy to have a place where I can share my prejudices with a captive audience that can't argue with me. Do have a strong and strong and severe editor? Um, yeah, I have several, actually. It starts with my wife, strongest and severest. Um, it goes to a group of my friends, and then my family, and then a, a private colleague of mine who edits, and then my agent sends it to the publishing house where it is edited. So it goes through a series of, yes, many. Sir? Uh, was Prague your first attempt to get published, and did you feel confident once you finished that uh, it would get published? It was not my first attempt. There was another book about which history has brought down the curtain gracefully, and no one need know anything about it. Um, I was very happy with Prague, and when I finished writing it, I thought, well, I've really done a great thing. I'm very proud of this work. No one will publish it, of course, because it would be great if somebody did, but it's statistically unlikely. Um, and that's just a fact of, I don't know if it's a similar statistical improbability here, but it's a, many good books, I'm sure, are not published. Um, good writers are ignored. Agents cannot read all the manuscripts they receive. Publishers don't publish everything that comes from the agent. Things that they do publish don't get any attention and disappear in weeks. It's, you know, it's an impossible statistic. So I, I hoped, but didn't, didn't expect. Sir? Uh, you, you described yourself as a non-European writer, uh, yet you lived in, in Europe for a long time. The themes of your books are not American. Uh, how would you define yourself as, as an American writer? I mean, by definition, I'm an American writer. Right? Yeah. I don't know what else to do. What are my choices? Maybe maybe a multiple choice question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know. I don't. I mean, and again, it's, that's not my department. I mean, someone else has got the marketing job of saying all those things. Um, I you know my goal is someday <clears throat> to be described with my own adjective, philipsium. <laughs> <laughs> You know, as I, I, all of my favorite writers have their own adjective. Um, every one of them. So that's, to me, that's, you've arrived when you get an adjective. Uh, there's an office that does it in New York. <laughs> uh, but that's, you know, unfortunately you're often dead before the adjective is issued. So, tragically. Yes, in the back? Uh, do you have time? <laughs> it takes a long time. All right. Um, usually, I, there's so many, and I, I'm afraid of missing people, so I go geographically. So we'll start in Canada. Uh, Robertson Davies. 
and there we go. One for Robertson Davies. Um, uh, just applaud freely during this. Uh, in the States, uh, Hemingway and Fitzgerald and J.D. Salinger meant a great deal to me. Um, Henry James, uh, down south to Borges. Um, and we'll come over to Europe and we'll... Uh, um, uh, Graham Greene, Tom Stoppard, uh, George Eliot, Virginia Woolf, um, Flaubert, Proust, uh, Thomas Mann, Kafka, um, uh, Svebo in Italy. I'm, I'm, I, I was afraid this question would come up and I would have to say with embarrassment that I don't, I don't know any Dutch writers. <laughs> um, and I, <laughs> well, somebody here might be Dutch, it's possible. Uh, and, I, and I was talking about it with Sander, my, my Dutch editor, and I, and I have on my list of things, I must read Harry Moolish. Says on my list of things to do, um, but I, I don't have a Dutch name to add. Um, Kundera, very much so. Nabokov is a great hero of mine. Um, I, I, I covered enough names. Okay. Sure. Yes, sir. I have kids and a, a dog and a home, and so you have to set hours, which are your work hours. I leave the house for it. I have set hours a certain number of day. Um, and during that time, I'm not allowed to do anything but sit in front of my stuff. And if I don't write, I don't write, but I'm not allowed to do anything else. So that's the rule. There was one in the back, I think. How did you uh, find yourself moving from uh, medieval Eastern, medieval European history to write? Oh, I mean, I was never going to be a medieval historian. That was just keeping me entertained. Um, as I think it probably does everybody, right? Uh, so I went through a lot of jobs, and writing came relatively late as these things go. Um, and it was, mo it was a product of a couple things. One was that I was feeling very nostalgic about Budapest and wanted to write about Budapest. The other was that I, um, I, was, getting, I was finding work as a professional writer doing things like advertising writing and copywriting for public relations and speeches. I was a speech writer for a while. Um, and so I realized I was writing every day already. And that's sort of a hurdle to get over. Oh, I've, look at this. I've written several hundred words. They're boring, unfortunately. Maybe I could do something else. So that's how it started. I just got a sign from Monique that yeah. time's, up, time's up. So thank you very much mm. for your reading. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. Thank you very much, Luke. There will be more chances to talk to Arthur because he will sign his book uh, later on, I think, on this table. But I must say that I think nostalgia cripples you nicely. Um, I'll remember that moment forever. Okay. <laughs> well, I think Prague was sold in 15 languages, countries. This one. Oh, this one. Yeah, the other and eight and, eight and 15, I, I see. It's, so it's, it's still in, in rise, and I'm sure there will be a moment we'll call. Like, this was really a... A Philipsy kind of <laughs> remark. Thank you also, Ruth, for uh, doing the introduction and, uh, and the questions. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I just wanted to end the uh, official part because there will be drinks later on and the bar and the bookstore is here and Arthur will stay for a little while. Uh, there are two events I want to draw your attention to. There is um, an extra event with a special guest. He's not American, but he's also very welcome. It's Louis de Bernier. He will come on uh, November 7th. Um, it's a special event. Um, it's on a Sunday night, and you can find out about it on our uh, information table, and you can also look at our website. I think everybody knows about now, and otherwise you can pick up a folder. Uh, on November 8th, a day later, <laughs> there is uh, the normal uh, event, John Adams Lecture, at the West India House with Russell Shorto, telling us all about the Dutch influence in um, old... New Amsterdam. Um, it's going to be very crowded, so if you want to come, please sign up quickly because it's nearly sold out. Um, that's then on the November 8th, on the Monday night with uh, moderator Tracy Metz. Um, that's what about my announcement. Hope to see you again soon. Have a safe trip home, and thanks again for coming. Thanks, you, Arthur, for, thank you. for your thank you. thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Monique.